ladies and gentlemen, Alex Hunter. Big applause. <laughs> Thank you for that, uh, making me sound a lot more important than I am. Uh, so yeah, th uh, this is the first time anybody is seeing these slides ever. So that's my disclaimer. Um, this is actually, this is what I wish somebody had told me when I was first started out uh, running my own businesses, getting involved in startup and business in general. So it's basically going to be 45 minutes of me alienating everybody who's ever helped me um, and begging for their forgiveness at the end. But um, as, you, as you heard, I, I am an, an angel investor. I've run my own startup. I've run other people's startups. I've run incubators, aggregators. I have been punched in the face a lot in my career. And I just want to share some of the things that I, the mistakes I made, the things that I were t was told that are completely incorrect uh, now that I've gone through the experience um, and hopefully correct a few myths that even in the last day or two I've, I've heard uh, come up over and over again. Um, <laughs> there, there is this ambition among entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, uh, to change the world. What does your product do? Well, we're going to change the world by creating more efficient canonical data structures for endpoint API access. No, you're not. You're not going to change the world. In fact, stop even thinking about changing the world. It's, just, it's, a, it's a very odd and bizarre uh, philosophy to w on which to base your business. So I, I would strongly suggest step away from the grandeur. Silicon Valley companies are very good about this. Uh, good at thinking they're going to change the world and spend more time and energy building something that's not terrible. Uh, you can't change the world with a crappy idea and the chances of, of you actually changing the world, and I hate to be the one to say it, are very, very low. But that's okay. You don't have to change the world. You don't have to be a billion dollar company. We have this, this pressure put on us as, a, as an industry, as a community of startups that if you're not going to be a billion dollar company, then there's no point in doing what you're doing, which is just not true. I'm hoping that we can shed that rather dangerous thinking. Um, <laughs> a bit negative. Oh, this isn't supposed to have sound. Oh, well. Um, uh, can you lower the volume? It's nice, though. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, I think it, another thing that we... we Serial entrepreneurs, which is just a nice way of saying douchebag, um, they gravitate towards ideas that they really don't know enough about to build an effective solution for. We, we try and create problem or solutions to problems that, that very few, if anybody, has. And I think that a much greater success uh, path is to build in an area in which you are familiar solve a problem that you actually have yourself. And, I th and again, instead of saying there's a market in, you know, South America that isn't served by this, that I think if we built this type of application, which I know nothing about, by the way, there's a market there. That's like walking off a cliff and building a parachute on the way down. It's not a great way to run a business. But if you keep running into the same problem, personal problem, like not personal hygiene problem, but just like this is something I struggle with every day or at work I run into the same problem over and over and over again. That is an extremely efficient market test for something uh, that you want to build. Because if you're solving your own problem, then even if no one ever gives you a dollar for anything that you build on top of this, you've solved your own problem. That's a great, great thing. So when you're first starting out, Solve a problem that you are confident in tackling and that you know exists and build it slowly and methodically, feature by feature, as opposed to going, this is what, this is my idea. That's what it's going to look like in three years and then trying to engineer what it's going to look like in three years because you will get frustrated and upset and demotivated and you'll lose steam. Whereas if you set a realistic goal early on and chip away at it, diligently, you're going to find a solution very, very quickly. 
in theory. So, you'll, there's going to be a count. Um, the, there's a weird sense that you have to be best friends with your co-founder or co-founders. You, you have to live together, uh, work together, eat and drink together, and you have to agree on everything. And it's just not true. I know some of the most successful partnerships in, in, for, in business history, not just internet history, who can't stand each other. They cannot stand each other. But they are like a good tennis doubles team. They are strong where the other is weak. They have very complementary skill sets. And if you're just starting up and you're, or, you're, or you're looking to, to bring someone on board at a, at a co-founder level, it doesn't matter if you all like the same movies or, or you know, like the same restaurants. A bit of friction is good because it, it makes that default mode a challenging one. Assumptions, assumptions are challenged, solutions are challenged, ideas are challenged. And if you have a, I love you and I think everything that you do is awesome, then you'll circle jerk yourself to death uh, and nothing good will come of it. That was kind of gross. Um, that said, too much friction, nothing gets done because you're too busy fighting like cats. So it, there's a healthy relationship between team member, early team members, co-founders, the people that are setting the direction for the organization. And it's okay to not like who you work with on a personal level. The VCs in the room are gonna hate me for this slide, but they're, there's a dangerous precedent in our world that you either go goodbye wife, husband, and or husband, I hope you don't have both, uh, and children, I'm going to go and do my startup for the next five years, enjoy growing up. Um, and that's, that's dangerous, unhealthy thinking. Um, there is absolutely nothing wrong with having an idea and spending an hour or two in the evening or very early in the morning or whatever iterating on that idea, building on that idea, as opposed to quitting your job, racking up a bunch of debt to build something that you haven't even done any market validation for. Don't be pressured into thinking that a startup or any business or any job, frankly, has to consume every waking moment of your hour. It's, it's just not true anymore. It's, it's dangerous, unhealthy thinking. Now, the, the challenge here is if you want to go and raise external finance, formal money, venture capital, and you tell them, yeah, I work on this for like 10 hours a month, the chances of them actually giving you money is, 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 is slim, but that's okay. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with building something like this where you can manage it from the beach. In fact, there are a lot of very successful people who run their entire organizations on a four-day work week. Very, very healthy. Very healthy attitude. Now, if you want to go and spend money, please try and spend someone else's money, not your money. There are a lot of very, very wealthy people in the world who have absolutely no idea with the, to, what to do with the billions of dollars they have at their disposal. They should probably give it to you, right? It's much better to spend their money than your money. And so I want to spend a few minutes talking about a lot of this stuff the stuff about formal venture capital or formal financing that I have, I've learned every single one of these lessons the hard way, which doesn't make me a crappy businessman, it just makes me an honest human being, right? <laughs> first, first thing to know, everybody in the Silicon Valley is fucking crazy. They're all out of their minds. They're all completely batshit insane, every single one of them. And I get to say that because that's where I'm from. We're all mental, absolutely mental. We live in this bubble where reality doesn't exist, everything is a billion dollar company, and everything has an Uber for everything. When you step out and you look back at the valley and you hear them talk, you go, Do you, can you even hear yourself? Do you have any idea the crap that's coming out of your mouth right now? This is extraordinary. That's what, I don't know how many of you have seen that show, that show is hilarious because it could be a documentary of how crazy Silicon Valley is. But that aside and the sort of 
the froth that this weird ecosystem generates, underneath is a very, very sophisticated, interesting, innovative environment. Not just from a financial perspective, but from a mentoring perspective, from a growth perspective, and from a talent perspective. So, yes, everybody in the Silicon Valley is crazy. Yes, the valuations are insane and not sustainable. But underneath that, there are some really interesting stories and some people doing some very interesting things. So I would encourage you to look beneath that initial layer of horse crap and find the quality stuff underneath because there is a lot of it, especially when it comes to raising money. The amount of times where I have walked into a VC's office uh, for myself or on behalf of somebody else or with somebody I've been mentoring and they have absolutely no understanding at a basic fundamental level how venture capital works is frightening absolutely terrifying i i've sat there with somebody who um i was am i gonna get sued for saying this there was a guy i knew uh who had a uh um uh, an interesting financial arrangement placed upon him and it was involved a merger and blah 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 I'm sure somebody will write a book about it and there were two co-founders and one of the co-founders knew what he was doing and the other didn't and they went into a VC's office and uh, separately and one of them signed a uh, a deal the dumb one signed a deal that basically gave uh, the VC's controlling interest of the company for equity and no cash. Um, it was an absolute train wreck because he didn't know what dilution meant. He didn't know what uh, pre-value, uh, pre-money valuation and post-money valuation meant. I mean, they, if you start an internet company or, or a startup at all, you are kind of like issued with this in the mail. It's like, congratulations on starting your startup. Here is all the terms that you need to know so that you don't get taken advantage of. If you are exploring raising any type of formal finance, do yourself a favor, spend at least a week understanding the basic of course every deal will be different but understand the terms and the gotchas and read about the disaster stories of people who have had their companies taken out from underneath them because of of bad vc deals not all vcs are evil just most of them so so just educate there are some fantastic books there's venture deals by brad feld did brad feld write that Excellent book uh, on, uh, uh, on, vent on very, very clearly written with exercises and all that. It's like a textbook. I, w I just sat in a, oh, the, with a few of, many of you might have been there, in, um, in the startup competition, and I was blown away by the quality of the product that had been created, the technology that had been, for, like I said when I was there, when you usually go to a startup competition, it's we've made a, stupid app that reminds you when to feed your dog and we were raising 180 million dollars these were really technologically revolutionary in some instances products and i was very very impressed but we had to reverse engineer the pitches to get to what it actually was and at whatever stage you are in your organization whatever role you play in that organization you have to be extremely comfortable with the story that you are trying to tell what are you doing and who is it for and what problem are you solving there's the classic mcclurism P pitch problem not solution it's amazing to me how many pitches i've heard where it's like it does this and it does that and it does this who is going to use it i don't know Students, maybe? I don't know. Students can't afford a $15,000 3D printer. What are you doing? I just made that example up. That wasn't reflecting anyone I heard today. But every, and I'm not, not just founders, when you go into pitch and you have to be able to say in 10 seconds what your company does, a little bit more detail in 30, 90, five minutes. But every single person in your organization, when somebody comes up to them and says, what do you guys do? Bam, out it comes, clear, concise, crisp.
not we're changing the world with blah, 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 blah. We build this for this by doing this. Simple, simple, simple. Yet 90% of businesses, even public companies, fail at that. So get comfortable with it and make sure everyone in your organization is also very comfortable. If you're raising finance, if you're raising external money and your bank balance is, and it always takes about 15 times longer than you expect it to, and you're watching your bank balance get lower and lower and lower as the process drags out and out and out, the temptation to take a crappy deal becomes greater and greater and greater because you go, I don't, I'm not going to be able to pay my team next month and this deal, I have to give them my kidney, but at least I can pay my bills next month. And it's an awful, awful position to be in. But I can tell you from firsthand experience, it is almost never a good thing to do. There will be so many, that's quite terrifying, isn't it? It's like out of a horror movie. Um, that is coming from that, right? <laughs> um, it will lead to compromise. It will lead to you giving more of your business away than you would ever have in a normal, unpressure, pressurized situation. Avoid it if, you, if at all cost. Even if you have to get a bridge loan from your original investors or there's a month of stuff on a credit card just so you can buy yourself enough time, Come email me. Well, I'll help you. Whatever it takes. Just don't take a crappy deal because you feel like you're running out of time. Walk away. Walk away. But get a second opinion <laughs> as well because you may be in that I forgot to educate myself box as well. So when you, it, there is no harm in, sh in, in getting some people to look over a term sheet or, or at least even the high level points of, a, of, a, of something that's being pitched to you. Get some feedback from people that have been through it before because they'll help you go, ah, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Did you read this line where they get to rename the company to whatever they want? In the US, well, the standard VC structure means that as a founder, you can be fired. <laughs> Stupid. This one pisses me off so much. As a culture, and I think we're second only to Hollywood in doing this, we celebrate venture capital raises. We put out press releases. We pop champagne. We throw big parties spending somebody else's money. And really what we're celebrating is we just gave a big old chunk away of our company to someone who doesn't really care about us. We're a line on a spreadsheet. Sorry, VCs. Many of you are benevolent, wonderful individuals, blah, 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 but you're not. Um, and of course, I'm being a little bit hyperbolic here, but I don't, I don't think it's a healthy thing to be celebrating. We should be celebrating growth and team hires and new countries and sales targets and stuff like that. It's, it's good. It's a, it's a good piece of news that you now have the finance to meet your ambitions, but it's not worth celebrating. TechCrunch or, or uh, tech.eu or any of those guys, they're less and less interested in stuff like that. Um, and even when it's a, 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 a list of celebrity investors, and it's bizarre that that's even a thing, celebrity investors, it's just not interesting anymore. Celebrate better, more positive things in your organization. If you manage to raise money, if that's the path that you have chosen on your journey to awesomeness, stop talking. It is extraordinary to me how we look at the social web as a customer acquisition channel, yet all we do is talk about ourselves and not to the customer. We write blog posts. We, write, we go to conferences and we stand on stage and we yap, yap, yap and we tweet and we make cute viral videos and blah, 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 blah. Meanwhile, not a line of code has been written, not a UX component locked down, not a graphic design. And a year goes by and we're still talking. We've got nothing to show for it. And guess what? Nobody's listening anymore. Because 
as a, an, a consumer of this information, we've got very good at going, I know what you're saying, but show me what you're doing. Produce something, throw something out there that I can touch at least with my eyes and experience and give you feedback on. We love to talk. We love to go and enter startup competitions, which is a good at a certain stage in our, in our growth, but not if we don't have anything to show for it. This is what we're going to build. That's like going on stage going, dude, 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 I have an idea. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but it's going to make a million dollars. Not ready yet. Not ready yet. Build something and then use that as the basis for your conversation. The quality of information and response that you get back will be exponentially greater than, look at this picture of the inside of our office. Look how empty it is and look how nobody's working. There are some amazing people who write consistently amazing articles, uh, both online and offline, about our industry and peripheral in in industries as well. Paul Graham is one of them, as controversial as he sometimes can be, that write pithy, interesting, helpful, borderline philosophical articles about running startups, building startups, uh, startup markets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He is the 1%. 99% of these things are link bait garbage. But when we find a problem, we run into a problem in our own organizations. We, we get a little bit lazy. And instead of working out the problem within our teams and, and reaching out to, to mentors and, and, and investors who can help us lead solve the problem ourselves, we go, we Google, like, how do I fix this? Or how do I get more people to come to my site? It's like, the answers you'll get to that question on Google are going to be link bait garbage. So be very judgmental. Be very fierce about what you let into your ecosystem, into your environment, and what you do with that information. Because a lot of people will give you a lot of things that they are absolutely positive, like I'm doing right now, are the right, are, is the correct thing. This, no, 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 don't listen to anybody else. This is, this is what you need to do. And then the next article will be an exact contradiction of what that person just said. And it's exhausting and it's frustrating. So you have to build up a strong filter and trust yourself, trust your gut in the decisions about your product, right? Who knows your product better than you? Answer, nobody. Trust your gut and run with it. Now, this is exciting for me because I've got no idea what slide's coming next either. I, I want to spend a few minutes on this. Um, I think it applies to businesses of almost any size and age and location. You've got your idea, you've solved your own problem, you've discovered more and more people than you thought have the same problem, you've built a solution, that solution has caught the imagination of one or more investors who have given you enough capital to scale, your revenue's going up, you have happy users, and you think now is the time to expand beyond your region, beyond your continent, doesn't really matter. But let's explore some, some philosophies behind this. Up until about 25 years ago, GE, one of the biggest companies on the planet, had one global strategy. We will do this and we will do it around the world and God help anybody that tries to stop us. It was quite an evil thing to do, but that's, that's just the way they thought, you know? It was better than, it was just efficient, they saw it. Now, they have 160 different strategies for 160 countries because they, quickly realized, as modern business has, regions are not homogenous, customers are not homogenous, different regions have different needs, infrastructures, cultural expectations and limitations, and they have adapted their business as a result in a very intelligent uh, manner. FedEx can deliver anything to anywhere on the planet, and if you think about the, the topographic and geographic diversity that our wonderful planet has, they have had to adapt their supply chain from gargantuan airplanes right down to a, a canal boat in Venice. That's not Photoshop. That's, that's actually how they deliver packages in Venice on FedEx, on a canal boat um, that took, took in, uh, uh, in Thailand 
electric vehicles now more and more, but they realize that they can't just fly an A300 massive airliner into a tiny outback uh, of Australia airport, and they've adapted. But the people that have got this, the, they've done the best job of this of any organization on the planet is McDonald's. And they, there's this phrase that's kind of a business speak word called glocalization, which is the, the balancing of global business infrastructure and strategy and aco the accommodation of local requirements, needs, and infrastructure limitations. McDonald's is everywhere. You cannot get away from McDonald's. To me, this is a blessing because I love this stuff. That's my Big Mac baby. <laughs> but I'm also fascinated by McDonald's uh, 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 business as well. Um, they have gotten so good at finding the right balance of familiarity wherever I go in the world and those local tastes. So that, you know, anywhere, any McDonald's on the planet, you can get a Big Mac, a Quarter Pounder, and a uh, McMuffin, in this instance, with ham. But I can also go around the world, and in India, and if you think about it, a large po percentage of the population in India don't eat beef. So McDonald's, if they just put out their standard stuff, sales, I think, would be disappointing. So knowing that, uh, and of course, they can't fry the fries and beef tallow and blah, blah, blah. They have the Muk Maharaja, and that's, that's what it's called. And it's chicken instead of, of beef. Uh, the middle one is the Bologi burger in Korea. And the right one, I can't remember what it is, but it looks pretty bad. Oh, it's a veggie burger. It's a veggie McMuffin. What a great way to start your day. Um, but they don't go, okay, 30% is local, 70% is global for every market. That's, that's their strategy. They go and they, they, they wait and they watch and they listen and they see what works, what doesn't work, they refine. And interestingly, they're collecting feedback and data from people on the ground at a franchise level and a corporate level and adopting regional operational tactics globally. So the... You, I said earlier that they no longer fry, they can't in India cook the chips, the fries in beef tallow because same, same reasons you can't have beef burgers. They realized that there are vegetarians outside of India. So they made that a global thing. McDonald's fries almost are not, entirely are not cooked. They're cooked in vegetable oil now, which changed the flavor a little bit. And I had a little bit of a hard time coming to terms with that. Um, but it's very interesting how that information went both ways. Go into a McDonald's and watch. I go to a McDonald's every country I, I go in. I just stare at the menu. I've been kicked out a few times, but, you know, it's good market research. In France, so Mc, uh, uh, Ronald McDonald, the creepy clown mascot for McDonald's, uh, is usually associated with Happy Meals, the kids' meals. In France, it just didn't go down well. There was a really visceral response to creeping the, the, the clown. And so they license uh, Asterix as the, the kind of the spokesperson in perpetuity for McDonald's uh, kids meals because that the clown just didn't, just didn't work. And they're fine with that. They didn't go, look, he's our mascot. This, we can't just get rid of, Mc, Mc, uh, what, is this called? what is he called? Ronald McDonald? It'd be like Disney getting rid of Mickey Mouse. But McDonald's, they, they get it, that you have to adapt to survive in different regions. And remember, this scales across 34,000 st uh, stores in 119 countries and, and 1.7 million staff. So it can, it can, that type of regional sympathy can, or sympathy is not the right word, but you know what I mean, across any industry and any size. They really are an extraordinary model. Those of you that have heard me speak before know this is um, where I little, get a little carried away. There are, you've probably read books and articles and, and blog posts about this word, the F word, um, failure. And it's something that I have a borderline sociopathic relationship with because I think it's, it's something that has set our industry back several years because it has been turned into a celebrity. We endorse failure. We love failure. We 
glorify failure as a badge of honor that one has to achieve before you can really attain the great heights of superstardom on the internet. You have to fail before you succeed. Failure is good. Failure is wonderful. It, it's not, and I'm gonna, I'm, I will never ever be persuaded otherwise. Failure is of very little value. It's a waste of time. Um, and the data that it produces is uh, overemphasized and often hugely misleading. This is, from, this is a quote from uh, the CEO and founder of a once large, now nearly dead internet company. And he said, as an entrepreneur, you have to get used to failure. It's just part of the path to success. That to me sounds like something a stupid person would say because it is entirely contradictory. To, to succeed, you must fail. That, that's that's all borderline paradoxical. It doesn't make any sense. And of course, the, the, uh, it's coming true because they're dying. This organization is dying. Um, it is a bizarre philosophy. And I think that there's, there, I have two theories about why this is so popular. One, the people that are failing and see that they're failing are using this, oh, it's okay to fail as a way of dealing with their own problems, like tequila, you know? When we're not, things aren't going well, we reach for the tequila. And in these instances, when things aren't going well and we're failing, we go, no, it's okay, this is part of the whole plan. This is our required failure before our success. Again, that sounds like something a crazy person would say. It doesn't make any sense. The tragedy in all of this, I think, is that the original message of learn from your mistakes, it's a, it's a reasonable one, right? You don't want to repeat the same mistakes that you've made. But because of this bizarre cult of failure, it's turned into you have to fail before you succeed. And even then, I would argue that the data that you get from success is far more valuable than the data that you get from failure, surely. The, when you fail, the only data you'll get is let's not do that again. <laughs> Whereas if you get data from success, it's let's just keep doing that over and over again because look at all the money that's raining down on us or the happy customers that we're creating. The worst part is, I think because we're so focused on failure, we've inadvertently become afraid of taking risk. Do, not, do you honestly think that if the guys that invented this thought they had to fail before they succeeded, they would have done it? No, they wouldn't have. And now they get to jump off cliffs in a sleeping bag. So I think there's a healthy balance between, okay, we failed, let's move on, uh, and just ignoring it as opposed to saying, oh, there's a man with a beer. Saying, yes, we have to fail before we succeed. Less ranty this time, yeah? There's a book called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. You all probably have seen it or read it. Um, I've never read it, but I just think this, the title is stupid because I don't think that there is such a thing as small stuff because in our world, our connected e economy, the small stuff is now the big stuff. The little things that we do are the ones that get amplified the fastest and are the easiest to change and are the easiest to create very targeted moments of delight with our customers and stories that people grab onto. The small stuff is what gets me coming back over and over again. Um, there's a hotel in New York. How am I doing on time? Fine. Um, there's a hotel in New York. Uh, you know when you go to a check-in at a hotel, you have to fill in a form, your name, your email address, probably your passport number. Well, at this one, this little tiny boutique hotel, standard information, and then at the bottom it said, what are your favorite snacks? I was like, oh, whatever, that's weird. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I have, a, for those of you that don't know me, I have an unhealthy relationship with Diet Coke. I, I consume a dangerously high amount of it. I can probably glow in the dark. So I wrote Diet Coke, blah, blah, blah. Finished the transaction. That piece of paper was taken away, paid the deposit and everything I do. And when I went up to my room, uh, there was a basket of all my favorite snacks as you can see there, including Diet Coke, and a handwritten letter from the management saying, hey, it's good, thanks for coming, Alex, welcome. We hope these things make you feel at home. I'm never staying in another hotel again. Anybody who bribes me with Diet Coke is a friend of mine. Now, 
My marketing friends in the room know that this is a cheap psychological trip to take away the sting of, home, uh, of, of feeling homesick by surrounding you with things that are familiar to, to you. It's a, very, it's, it's a proven psychological fact. Very good hotels do it all the time. Uh, and they, it worked. You know, I didn't feel as far away from my, my friends and family because I was surrounded by unhealthy food. But here's what they got right, and that's easy. But here's the thing. Every time I go back to that hotel, this is eight years I've been going to this hotel. They don't have to ask me the same question. I go up to my hotel room, and there it is saying, welcome back, Alex. We got your favorite snacks. If there's anything that you've gone off of or you've changed your mind, just let us know. It would be the same as me. And it's extraordinary to me how we forget these conversations that we've had with our customers. Like it would be like me going up and saying, hey, I'm Alex. And Max says, hey, I'm Max. Cool. And then I walk away. And 30 seconds later, I go, hey, I'm Alex. And he's like, dude, we, ju we just met. You're kind of a dick for not remembering that. And that's the same impression that we're giving our customers when we keep asking for the same information or we don't remember our previous interaction. It's the same feeling that we give our customers. And yet, with the technology we have today, it's so easy to solve. And I think that what these guys did and the companies that do really, really well is we're all good at optimizing transactions. We squeeze every last penny out of every last link to make sure it is optimized as it's going to get. Where these guys, and Apple do this as well, they'll break the rules to invest in the relationship. So even though they, yeah, maybe they could have upsold me on some, you know, internet or Wi-Fi at the hotel, um, but by giving it to me for free or giving me you know, $2 worth of snacks. I've gone back for eight years now to that same hotel, probably paid above the odds in my nightly, my nightly rate. And that investment of a couple of snacks and some Diet Coke has paid off 50x. Apple will break the rules out of warranty and replace a device for customers they know have been loyal. And that's why they're loyal in the first place, because they know their customers. They remember the context, broader context of their relationship. Everybody know what that is? Thermostat, right? So Nest, the design by the guy that design, originally designed the iPod, it's a very uh, amazing device. And the challenge I get when I talk a lot about branding is that, oh, Alex, I'm in, I'm in uh, I don't know, what's boring, what's a boring industry? Insurance underwriting, right? That's boring, isn't it? I can't be sexy, we can't sexify our industry. Horseshit, absolutely not true. There is absolutely no industry in the world, and I have yet to hear a, a, a challenge to this, that cannot have the same revolution that the Nest put the thermostat and home uh, management industry through. And look at the, look at the, the, the energy, like mental energy, not, not electrical energy. It has kicked off in the internet of things and smart homes and wearables. That's all because of innovation like this. They, thermostats are generally white or beige boxes that sit on the wall uh, in a very old school uh, readout, make our houses too hot in the summer and too cold in the winter. And They've not only gone at a technological level, yes, we can make it more efficient so it learns your patterns, but it's also so beautiful that I just want to go up and lick it. So they've thought about the human experience and the technology experience, and you can do that with just about anything. The C word, community. This is something that marketing people like me love going on about, and it's diluted the value of this very precious term a lot. And I want to focus on a very specific component, which is the individual people that are enthusiastic about what you do. And I'm going to just tell you a really quick story. There's a company in London called Pact, and it's just a, sub a subscription coffee company. Every week or two weeks, through your mailbox comes a little envelope full of coffee. Now, I'm not a big... I like coffee, but I don't know... You know, I, I'm not a coffee connoisseur, but at my previous job, I worked with people that had like meth lab level setup, coffee setups, and who liked good coffee. And we had this come into the office. It's good stuff. Anyway, 
about a week before Christmas last year, I was sitting at my grandmother's house in the countryside in England, flicking through Twitter, pretty hungover, trying not to move anything else on my body except my thumb. And this sponsored tweet, I don't follow them on Twitter, this sponsored tweet came up and it was from them and it said, proper coffee, blah, 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 hand It was an ad. It was an ad for their service. And I was in a bad mood and I have a, uh, I don't like the word proper in marketing. It's overused in the UK. It's very smug and elitist and it's sort of a, I'm telling you that I'm better than you because everyone else is just terrible. It's a very British word. And I, for some reason, I was so pissed off and hung over by this word that I replied to a sponsored tweet, which is a little bit crazy, but I did. And I said, guys, and look, I even did the, the total jerk move of putting a, full, a period, a full stop, so that everybody in my, my feed would see it. I mean, that's just only, only bad people do that. Negative points for using the word proper, you're better than that, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, great, I've, I'm, I've done my angry old man bit, I put my phone away. This is Saturday afternoon. And moments later, literally moments later, my phone dinged. I was like, what the heck? They replied, this is a six-man team on a Saturday a week before Christmas. Sorry, we didn't mean to sound snobbish. We're just looking for a, a word that conveys good taste, blah, blah, blah. And I was like flabbergasted. Wow, you replied on a Saturday. IBM couldn't even do that. <laughs> well done. That's, that's a put you very high on my books. You've already done it. But my philosophy is this. If you genuinely believe in the quality of your product, you have every right to be confident. That is how the Virgin Group got to where it was. Confidence in the quality of, of the delivery of the product. So you, you can say that. And just like confidence in a person is very, very attractive, confidence in a brand is also very, very attractive. And I replied basically to that effect, saying, it's okay to call yourselves great. That's confident. Telling me you're proper is elitist and, and, and kind of a jerk. I love what you're doing and keep doing it. And they replied, um, briefly and quickly and, and very humbly. And I thought, great, I have a case study to share on stage with people that somebody replied and it's hustle and it's one-on-one -on -one conversation and all of the stuff that we love to talk about. But they weren't done with me yet. Saturday, go in the office on Monday, four o'clock in the afternoon, there's a knock on the door. And a recycled Amazon box appears on my desk. I opened it up and there is bags and bags of coffee and a handwritten letter that says, Dear Alex, we hope you and your loved ones enjoy this over the festive period. Great coffee, sent fresh, love packed. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Now, this, it's a great story. It doesn't cost them much money at all to send, to, to, to courier it over to me. Um, I just love the story, but here's the thing that I think wowed me the most. I was already a customer. I, they weren't trying to woo me or get me to subscribe. I was already paying them each week for coffee. As far as most business is concerned, there, I would need zero effort. I am, I am in the, we don't need to worry about them box. But these guys went out of their way to delight an existing customer. And I wish more of us would take the time to delight our existing customers instead of trying to chase the next customer. And on that note, all I want to say is, is keep working hard, go delight that customer, and continue to build the amazing things that you're doing in Poland. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate your time.